This special edition of CES Tech Talk is brought to you by Bell. Bell is developing new concepts of mobility to make moving people and products more efficient and effective and redefining the experience of flight. Hey, everybody. Tyler Suters with the Consumer Technology Association. We are the owner and producer of CES, the most influential tech event on the planet. We are getting you all geared up to make sure you are CES ready in 2019. The show is not far off, January 8th to 11th in Las Vegas. Well, this you know if you've been to CES, and if all you've done is listen to our podcasts, you've probably heard these topics yourself. But CES is the location for innovation, for what's next. It's the global stage for innovation and the technologies of today and tomorrow. That includes self-driving vehicles. That includes drones. Uh, even the sharing economy is represented there at CES. But today's topic envelops all three of these, self-driving vehicles, drones, and the sharing economy. And when you put them all together, the equation adds up to air taxis. Yeah, pause and think about that. These are very close to becoming realities and solving transportation problems across the country and probably across the world, too. So this week, we are talking to an aviation pioneer. This company was the very first to certify a commercial helicopter. Also, an iconic disruptive innovator, the company who happened to give us the new verb Ubering. I think you know who that is. And also an international high-tech aerospace group from France that is a critical supplier to some of the companies you know well. All of that is on this week's edition of CES Tech Talk. We have a full cast here in the CTA studios today. With me is Michael Thacker, who is Executive Vice President of Technology and Innovation with Bell. Also, Mark Moore, who is the Engineering Director of Aviation with Uber. And from Safran, Jean-Baptiste Geron, who is Vice President of the Program for Hybrid Propulsion Systems. Gentlemen, a long introduction. Thanks all for taking time with me today. Thank you. Glad Thank to be you. here. Uh, Michael, let's start with you. Since Bell is a traditional, I would say, uh, aviation company and has been been in the industry for so long, where are we right now uh, in terms of aviation and transportation with technology mixed in? So I, I would say we're at an inflection point. And, mm -hmm. and while Bell is a traditional aviation company, we've been innovating the way people fly for over 80 years. Mm -hmm. So um, a history of innovation. And, and I think much like the dawning of the jet age, we're at an inflection point where the convergence of te technology and societal norms are coming together in a way that's going to change the way people move, particularly moving about cities. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, let's turn to you. Uber, of course, screams technology and transportation right now. Aviation, uh, I think, will catch many people by surprise that you all are heading in this direction. Yeah, I mean, Uber has done an incredible job over the last seven years of proving that there is this huge demand for on-demand transportation, mm -hmm. especially in, in, in the major metropolitan markets where the vast majority of trips take place. But Uber has no experience in aviation, and that mm -hmm. is exactly why Uber is partnering up with, with Bell because they have so much experience, especially in terms of ensuring safety, because it is about safety first in transportation. Mm -hmm. So we just couldn't be more thrilled with the, the partnership that we have because it, it leverages the strength of both companies. Mm -hmm. Uber at pr knowing and proving this on-demand market and taking bold moves into disrupting uh, uh, markets and, and and getting them getting them going and Bell with fantastic vertical flight products, which is what we're talking about: being able to take off and land vertically, get across the city, and be super productive with uh, your travel time. Mm -hmm. uh, Jean Baptiste, I gave away I think to some degree Saffron's role in this when I was uh, reading your title, uh, Hybrid Propulsion Systems. This is hybrid electric, right? We're talking about clean energy and its role in this emerging sector. 
Uh, yeah, well, we are talking about electrifying the vehicles. Um, so, and uh, for that, we will take advantage of the power source. The objective is to be, uh, I would say, clean. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality today, in terms of power density, uh, fuel is, is clearly way ahead of, of battery cells mm -hmm. as of today. And, and that's why we have agreed with, uh, with Bell and Uber that hybridization will be the next step before going full electric uh, and get rid totally uh, of, the, uh, of the oil. Mm -hmm. Um, is there any potential apprehension among your marketplace? I'm thinking potentially of consumers. Um, the idea of, of an air taxi, to use a very clumsy term, um, is certainly a challenge for many to overcome. The fact that that does not have a traditional propulsion system may be an added hindrance just from a perception standpoint from consumers. Are we close to dealing with that yet, or is that so far in the future that's not even a concern? All right. Uh, in terms of uh, hybrid propulsion, uh, I would say we, we are the closest, uh, <laughs> in fact. So the technology is there. Uh, we've demonstrated it uh, a few months ago with, uh, with a demo on the ground run. Uh, we just share uh, the, the, the video with, uh, with, with Uber. Uh, so today, in terms of technology, Saffron has everything it requires, electric motors, distribution, generators, turbines. Mm -hmm. And so we can propose uh, the full hybrid system. And this is why uh, Bell uh, partnered with us. Uh, and we have that exciting journey together. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other uh, challenges ahead, which will take maybe a little longer. Uh, such as safety, certification, social, social acceptance. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of technology for the hybrid propulsion system, we are there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, in terms of public acceptance, though, of the technology, I, I don't see it as being a huge leap. Mm -hmm. As uh, automotive and many other industries have been moving towards electrification, aircraft has as ha have as well. It's been in systems, uh, and, and now we're moving into that for full propulsion. I don't think that'll be a huge leap for people to overcome. And mm -hmm. Bell has been making things fly for 80 years, yeah. and we've been making things take off and land vertically and move on to wing and fly rapidly in forward flight with things like the V-22 tilt rotor for decades as well. So with the safety focus of this team and the experience that we have together, I don't have any concerns about the ability to get the public to step on the aircraft to take the flight. Well, Michael and Mark, for, for you two, um, that begs the question about the, the unique partnership that you all have. Uber is a company that's not quite 10 years old. Um, Bell is coming up on 85 years in industry. Uh, what is the common ground that, that you all have and also the unique perspectives that, that your respective companies bring to this partnership? Well, I'll start. I think Please, uh, you know, the, the first thing is we have a shared vision for what mobility can be in cities and the mm -hmm. idea that this on-demand um, society, whether it's package delivery or the ability to move across town, um, is an opportunity for both of us. And uh, Mark mentioned it earlier, we have kind of complementary expertise. We know how to make things fly. We know how to operate them. We know how to do it safely. We know how to deal with regulators and to be able to work through the aviation system and hold those high expectations. Uber has a great experience in their, in their short history of being able to create this ride-sharing market and this on-demand transportation system, and the two of them will marry together very nicely. Mm -hmm. Mark? Yeah, I mean, Uber is a software company, and uh, what we're talking about here are aircraft that can take off and land vertically, which are very much a brand new type of hardware, and, and especially it's highly integrated software, uh, hardware and software and digital flight control systems. So to have the expertise of Bell on on the hardware be able to couple in with our system management uh, on the software side of things is really the best of both worlds. Um, what about a temperature check of where we are right now? As I mentioned before, the idea of an air taxi is a game changer, I think, for a lot of people to even conceive, much less in, in, envision. Um, ride sharing, tech enabled ride sharing, was disruptive innovation. Uh, um, at its peak in some senses, when, when Uber um, hit mass market. Where are we right now? So I think the technologies to enable this transformation of flight exist today. Mm -hmm. The integration of those, the regulatory framework, the operational framework to be able to bring them to market mm -hmm. is still a work in progress. So we're integrating the technologies into vehicles, which will be capable of performing the mission that we've described, taking people across town, doing so safely, vertical takeoff and landing. 
we're working with regulators and communities to get the regulatory framework and the public acceptance to be able to move to that next step, which is carrying people across town in commercial service. Mm -hmm. And our expectation is that'll happen in the mid-2020s. We think it's that close. I love hearing a time frame. (laughs) Mark, how about you? You're used to moving exceptionally quickly at Uber. Yes, and we, and we believe it's very important to have a foreseen function for mm-hmm. this new capability. Um, we have, across the system, um, billions of dollars being invested in this new transportation system. So there are you know, strong expectations from that investment to, for this system to be rolled out in a timely manner. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, we have set 2023, by the end of 2023, to be the introduction of the first few vehicles. Mm-hmm. And starting in Bell's home city of Dallas as the very first city. Um, mm-hmm. It's a very aviation friendly and aviation pioneering uh, location. And again, we couldn't be more excited that that has been chosen as the place for this all to start. Mm-hmm. Um, Jean-Baptiste, regarding the idea of hybrid electric propulsion um, and, and the timing of the rollout, is a general trend toward smart cities, whether that's smart city development or smart city envisioning, just the inception, part of the driver here, do you see that as lifting what we'll call the air taxi industry in in the decade ahead or so? Well, it, it depends in which part of the world and uh, and, and to which politics and mayors you, you talk to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, for General Safran, we share the vision of Bell and, uh, and Uber for that. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of technology and, and uh, mass markets, uh, what we believe is that it, it will be a two-step approach. Uh, mm-hmm. will be uh, most probably in the time frame mentioned by uh, by Mark and Michael, 2023, mid 2020s, mm-hmm. uh, for the first uh, operations, uh, which will be hybrid, uh, because uh, because uh, the battery power density won't be there uh, by that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, will be a direct route, uh, so to make sure that you avoid a crowded population uh, below uh, below below the plane, uh, but it will start there. And then as uh, the confidence gain, as the safety demonstrates, as the technology progress for the batteries, we will uh, we will uh, more and more get closer to a mass market. So success will beget more success, correct? Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's how aviation was born. Mm-hmm. If you look back 100 years ago, uh, that's how it all started. Mm-hmm. Um, going back to, to Bell, Michael, um, I love this language that, that the company uses. You refer to flying cars, as I'm quoting here, shorthand for a just out of reach future. So the simple question is, are they in their gra- in, in our grasp? And you would say by 2023, yes. But take that as a as a larger concept and exactly what this represents to us, you know, as, as society accepting these rapid fire tech innovations. So, so I really think society. Part of what makes this the perfect time is that society's ready. We already talked about the change in expectations of people today with regard to on demand, whether it's getting your package delivered the same day or being able to call an Uber and have your car arrive and take you to your destination within a couple minutes and to be able to choose what level of transportation you want, who your driver is, to be able to make all those matches. So the expectation of an on-demand society is already there. The adding of the third dimension has become critical because we also have a trend of urbanization, more and more people moving into urban centers, which makes the congestion in cities like the one I live in, Dallas and Fort Worth, Mm -hmm. getting more and more congested and more and more time that people spend in traffic, more and more time that your packages spend in transit. And we're losing billions of dollars in economic cost, as well as the personal time that you and I give up with our families and others as we go about the business of our day. So I think societally, we can be ready for this because it solves a critical challenge that we have. One of the elements that will be critical for that is the accessibility of it so you and I can take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. So to make this work, we have to get to scale. We have to get to the point where it isn't just a few people in a few very expensive aircraft flying across town and taking advantage of this. It has to be something that's within reach of you and I being able to use Mm -hmm. and have it benefit our lives. And, And with what we're doing and the approach we're taking, we can get there. Mark? And, and, and that's what Uber cares about. I mean, Uber would not be making these investments unless we knew there was a path to scale. Mm-hmm. So we're not just doing this for a few flights. We're doing this to create a new transportation solution that gives people in these large metropolitan 
areas a new choice. Um, and I, I, I agree with uh, so strongly that not only is the technology ready, not only are, are, are the people ready, but it's stronger than that. It is that there is a compelling need for an alternative to ground gridlock. And what's so cool about taking advantage of the third dimension hmm. into flight is that you're not stuck on the ground with pathway dependent transportation. All of a sudden, the path becomes irrelevant. You can go in any direction, and three dimension provides you lots of space for capacity. That sounds like a microcosm for tech evolution and innovation in general, right? <laughs> well, it's yeah, and that's why it's kind of like the the internet, where um, again we live in exciting times, where you've got Hyperloop, and you know now Elon Musk talking about the Boring Company, but still those are pathway based systems. If you look at the internet, part of the incredible capacity and speed of it is that it's a nodal based system. It's based on different nodes, and you can basically get to each one of those nodes in a huge number of different ways. It isn't path dependent. And what we're talking about and building together is a node-based system where if, if you've got 50 nodes and you add one more, well, now all of a sudden you have 50 new pathways, 50 new ways you can take those routes. While if you have a, a ground rail system and you add one more station, You've got one more station. Mm -hmm. That's it. So it really is about being able to tap into this geometric growth uh, uh, that permits just huge capacities mm -hmm. and overcomes these gridlock problems on the ground. Mm -hmm. Jean Baptiste, yeah, I was just taking the um, I would say the explanation of Michael and uh, and Mark, and which also explain why a young company like Uber and and older companies like Saffron and Bell, because all together we are 150 years old, mm -hmm. uh, work together, that when we talk about efficiency, which is at the heart uh, of, of the propulsion system, mm -hmm. uh, it's when you uh, have the interaction of Uber's and Bell and Saffron technologies that we make a system efficient. Um, getting in, in the right, in, in, I would say in the three, three dimensions, um, with a system, and, and Uber has demonstrated it can, uh, I would say, um, revolutionize ride sharing. If you put four people uh, in a Bell, uh, I would say, um, air vehicle, uh, we will be more efficient uh, than a single rider in a taxi mm -hmm. uh, to do the, uh, the Dallas, uh, the Dallas Port was the airport. Mm -hmm. So we will be just more efficient, and that's how the cost will get affordable for most of the population. And that's what's critical, is being able to get this service at a reasonable cost. Mm -hmm. And each of us have a, a critical part to, to play, whether it's the efficiency of the propulsion system or the efficiency and lightweightness of the vehicle or just being able to fill the vehicle each time you do a flight so that that cost is amortized over more people, which is exactly what we do on the ground with uber pool so it's just it really is this wonderful marriage where each company is is bringing the pieces to achieve efficiency and cost effectiveness in this new transportation system that's a great point about efficiency mark uh jean baptiste what about the energy efficiency at play here so the energy efficiency uh, will come from from the pooling that uh, Mark will uh, will explain later. Uh, it comes from the aircraft, mm -hmm. and Michael will explain that later, and it comes from the uh, from the propulsion system. For the propulsion system, uh, what's uh, very good with hybridization is that we can take advantage of the battery or the turbo generator, which is a turbine and a high speed uh, generator, uh, to get the energy. And so we can uh, basically uh, select the rate of hybridization according to the mission we have to do. And so are we a little more electric? Are we a little more relying on fuel? Mm -hmm. And then we take advantage uh, of the multi-rotor uh, and uh, of the hybrid system to make sure that we will use the turbine always at its right point of dimensioning. So I don't know if I'm clear there, but basically today a turbine and a helicopter, it's the worst case scenario for a, any engine manufacturer <laughs> because the because turbine has to, uh, to adapt all the time uh, to the pitch, uh, to, to the pilot demands, uh, to the loads, uh, and so on. In a hybrid system, uh, the turbine is designed to work always to run the generator. And so at a given, given speed, 
a given pace. And, and so for us, it's, uh, it's something we can use to make it as efficient as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, the idea of pooling is certainly familiar for anybody who uses ride sharing. Um, almost an exponential efficiency saver in this case, right? Yeah, because you're sh literally sharing the ride, which then amortizes that, that, that energy, amortizes that cost across everyone. So instead of, you know, paying for the trip yourself, uh, I mean, it's just like on the ground. An UberX is $15. If you do Uber Pool, it becomes about a $5 trip mm -hmm. because you're sharing the experience and leveraging um, uh, the other riders to, to use that same vehicle on a trip that's going in a very similar place um, to, again, be, be smart in terms of the energy usage and the, the, the cost to each individual passenger. Right, sharing the energy use to some degree and, and having one sized carbon footprint, I guess, for a given trip. Yeah, and, and the reason we can do that is because um, we have uh, it's just such a huge customer base. We have over 70 um, million monthly active users. Um, I believe we do uh, over 10 million trips a day. <laughs> and it's it, it's that power of the market to come together in volume that really pushes to uh, you, you know this cost effectiveness. Mm -hmm. I still shake my head. Ten million trips a day for a company that isn't ten years old. <laughs> Things move fast these days, and and you know that's why I've been in aerospace uh, my you know my entire career, thirty two years at NASA and two years at Uber, and. It is exciting to see aerospace now um, getting into the fast lane. And we're in this new era that's very Wright Brother-like, where it's just like the innovation is happening so fast, you can't sit back. And in the aerospace world, it was a slower pace over much of my career. Mm -hmm. and, but now all of a sudden, everything's just happening at the pace of Uber. <laughs> well, but, <laughs> you may. but we try to follow. <laughs> well, yeah, and that's the, 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 the good point is certification is hard, hard work, because mm -hmm. the FAA and EASA absolutely want to make sure that this is completely safe. So, um, but even, even FAA and, and EASA have fundamentally changed how they're going about the certification of these small vehicles, mm -hmm. where they've gone to consensus-based standards that lets these new technologies be certified so much quicker. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's not just exciting new technologies or exciting new business cases. The regulatory framework for us has changed over the last three years to enable this to move very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, Michael, I uh, apologize in advance for an asking someone with such a deep engineering background about some policy <laughs> issues, especially <laughs> around infrastructure, but that is a consideration for what, what we will see with, with air taxis. Um, and that's an area where innovation runs into speed bumps. So. The regulatory piece is certainly in place. Infrastructure is another one. It's going to be a critical element of making the system work. You know, but Mark hit on it a little bit earlier with this pathway-dependent idea of ground transportation. If you think about infrastructure and what it takes to put a node onto our system, it's a vertiport. It's the size of potentially a parking lot or the top of a building, and it's in a single location. To add infrastructure that's on rail or a highway or even Hyperloop, it means you're taking out miles of pathway through somebody's neighborhood, through somebody's business. You're disrupting lives and livelihoods to be able to create this new transportation infrastructure. We're actually right. very uh, infrastructure light in that regard. Because you have to get there in all the other cases that you're describing Absolutely. either on or under the ground. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then beyond that, you know, Mark talked a little bit about the, the pooling concept from an efficiency standpoint, but there's also an efficiency to be gained by making the vehicles the right way. If we can optimize the vehicles to, to make sure that they can turn around in five minutes mm -hmm. uh, so that you can have fewer vehicles serving the, the same population of communities and still manage to serve all of the, the, the business that's being requested, then that's another efficiency in the system in terms of maintenance costs, in terms of asset needs. 
need. So mm -hmm. there are a, a huge number of opportunities for this to be a highly efficient system mm -hmm. and to be more efficient than the ground systems we have today. Let me get back into your wheelhouse of engineering. I'm sure that's much <laughs> most comfortable for you. Um, the, the, the issue of turnaround, as you said, um, when we're involved in ride sharing, you don't think of any, and you don't think twice of being dropped off in a car and that car, maybe picking someone else up at the very same restaurant, the very same building. Um, but there is a turnaround time that is necessary inherently with helicopters today. Uh, where are we right now in terms of what's required? So I, again, if you think about the existing aviation system and the turnaround. You have post-flight checks, you have pre-flight checks, you have a walk around of the vehicle, mm -hmm. you have to make sure that the propulsion system is ready to refire again and in some turbine-based uh, systems. Uh, you've got a wait time before you can relight an engine that's been turned off. And so again, by architecting the system so it's incredibly reliable, that it goes through post and pre-flight checks in an automated way on its own to identify if there are any issues that would cause it not to be able to fly. Mm -hmm. Those are ways that you opt Optimize the system to be able to get that five-minute turnaround. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk uh, about CES 2019 um, because this sector incorporates two of my favorite aspects of the show. One is you never know what you're going to see next. And the other is there's so much innovation that at least for those of us outside the, the engineering and, and coding sector may not have even conceived. Um, what is your place at CES and I, I say this to all three of you, as we're talking about air transport for consumers. Yeah, so uh, we were excited last year to be a part of the Urban Mobility Hall. Uh, obviously, it was mostly automotive and people talking about automating vehicles. And oh, exactly. We, were, we exactly. were very excited to come in and let people know there is a third dimension that can make <laughs> your life better. Uh, and so we shared uh, a, a, an air, a Bell Air Taxi experience, allowing people to virtually understand what an air taxi could do for them, how it could relate to their life and be integrated into their life and bring benefit to them. Mm -hmm. um, this year, we'll bring a little bit more. Obviously, we have our partners uh, from Safran here with us today. So we'll be sharing a little bit more about the how the aircraft is going to fly, the mm -hmm. propulsion system, uh, and take it to that next step to help people understand how we're going to make it a reality for them in the near future. Mm -hmm. Is it a bit about partnerships, too? Whom you meet, whom you connect with, um, the unforeseen discussions that occur while you're there? So. Yeah. Go ahead. It, Mark, it, it's please. definitely uh, about partnerships, but even more than that. I mean, yeah, if you go to any conference, it's it's not about any one meeting. It's about those random uh, times when you bump into someone and, oh, my gosh, something magical happens in terms of creating a new partnership or a new idea or things just click in some way. Right, the serendipity. Right? Yeah, so yeah. The, the networking opportunity is fantastic. But also, I mean, one of the – powerful things about CES is being able to reach consumers. And as Michael said, we have to provide context and uh, understanding for them to get ready for this market, right? I mean, when you go back to the automobile, when it was uh, introduced um, to replace horses and carriages, it literally took 30 years and one generation to die off before the new generation was ready mm -hmm. to embrace Devil wagons, that's what they called them, <laughs> right? And, and because they, they weren't acclimated to it. So CES gives this wonderful opportunity to reach out to the people who are going to be benefiting from this and, and, and get a contextual experience um, uh, from Bell of, uh, of the products that they're developing. You know, you, you, you mentioned the consumer, but it's also um, a great opportunity to engage with communities. You mentioned smart cities and how mm -hmm. this plays into the idea of greener, cleaner, more mobile cities, more interactive cities. And there's a huge contingent of folks at CES who are absolutely focused on what does a smart city really look like? And so it's a great opportunity for us to interplay with the rest of what's going on in that technology community to help people understand what their options really are. And it, that, that it's much wider open than they think in terms of the mobility solutions that can be brought to the city to help get to that, to achieve that goal. So Jean-Baptiste, this will be your very first CES. Uh, it's rare that we get to talk to someone who hasn't been before. Uh, do you know what to expect? Do you know what you're in for? Do you have an idea of all the people you'll meet and the innovation you'll see and the ideals you'll come away with? Uh, not at all. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, that's the fun of it, uh, I would say. Uh, we go there uh, through Bell uh, because we are there to uh, to, uh, to explain how, uh, how the hybrid system works, uh, why it exists today 
because most of the people are doubtful about it. So we will demonstrate that. And uh, then we will have uh, eyes and ears wide open uh, to get to the technology. Michael mentioned the uh, five minutes turnaround, turnaround time. Uh, we need to achieve that, and that's where we, we still can progress in automatic pre-diag, in, uh, in having health monitoring fully, uh, fully automated with, uh, with the latest software. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll for sure, we'll have a glance around to see uh, with whom we could, uh, we could work and, and make the system even better. Excellent. Mark? Well, one of the reasons I'm excited about uh, having this uh, be at CES is if you look at these aircraft, more and more they're getting away from the mechanical complexity and turning into digital devices. Mm. And CES is the place for digital devices. And more and more, there's going to be software systems and digital monitor health monitoring systems and all these different pieces that come together into digital aircraft systems. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much opportunity for coming together to see what new pieces can make Bell's aircraft even more phenomenal. Yeah. So what particular areas are you planning to, to, to scout or, or visit in that vein, Mark? Is it, uh, is it all through um, transportation technologies? Are you moving into connectivity and 5G or, oh, or AI yes, or all of the above? Because these aircraft are going to be so connected. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, on the network, um, you know, we need to know the battery state. We need These aircraft need to be essentially orchestrated everything is happening knowing about everything else and so yes from interconnectedness to to um, to the transportation hall um, you name it but that's why but you got to get outside of your own world right and you got to see where there's just some magic that you didn't expect <laughs> in some new area I've never made it all the way through all of CES I'll admit neither have I <laughs> so you know maybe this time I can have that at be as a go uh, Michael, I see you nodding along. Uh, yeah, no, I'm excited to go with it because, like you say, you never know what you're going to see in those kind of unexpected connections. And, and right now there is so much really in common across so many different disciplines that can come together. You talked about the connectivity piece. Certainly you mentioned 5G and the ability to communicate on and off the aircraft with high speed, secure, good bandwidth within cities is going to be critical for making these vehicles operate correctly. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned AI, and, and I, I kind of like I kind of like to think of AI as augmented intelligence as opposed to artificial intelligence, because mm -hmm. really it comes about making sure that we're taking full advantage of what the computational capabilities that are available today can do for us, and and, and also taking full advantage of what humans are good at and bringing those things together. And so I'm really excited to look and see how people are moving in all these different spaces, whether it's automotive, whether it's smart cities, or or, mm -hmm. or the cons the digital devices that Mark talked about. Because because all of them have pieces that we can take and integrate into the aviation part, which we already know how to do well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially like even cybersecurity, if we could leverage what's going on in different areas, yeah, um, we're behind the curve in that one specific topic. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to pull back for a final question to some degree to where we started, right? The nexus of transportation and technology, specifically air transportation. Um, to go around to each one of you and say, um, if you're looking ahead to the next milestone in, in air transportation in this sector, what is it going to be and, and when do you expect it? So, Jean-Baptiste, we'll start with you. Well, um, we, we are just creating it now, I would say, yeah. uh, because we are, I mean, we are really taking advantage of electrification uh, to make the aircraft uh, reshaped and, and, and taking more efficient. Uh, on what we have, the, the revolution we had is basically the one which happened a century ago when the industry moved uh, from uh, mechanical interfaces. I mean, uh, the former textile company, before having machines, they were all mechanized. And today we can take advantage of electrification, uh, for example, to leave the single rotor and to go to multi-rotors mm -hmm. because it's so easy to transport electricity on board. It's not that easy for everyone. Of course, we are on very high voltage and so on, but compared to, to mechanical, it's quite easy. And so we can we can reshape and, and we can take full advantage to get quite efficient. And mm -hmm. the, the hybridization is just the power generation. Hybrid for us today means uh, a turbo generator and battery. Hybridization tomorrow will mean uh, fuel cell 
and battery or fuel cell and supercapacitor, uh, but will just be there to provide the most efficient power source to take advantage of the new designs that typically Bell is, is developing today with the mm -hmm. multi-rotor. Mm -hmm. Mark, what about you? I'm going to let Michael go because it, the natural thing to talk about right now is the vehicle. All right, that's fair. And the that's vehicle fair. demonstrations happening in 2020. All right, that's an official pass. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll take the past buck. Yeah, I, and I, I think Mark hit it, though. You know, we, we already see people flying, uh, you know, different sizes, types of vehicles with different capabilities, not all of which hit the full mark of being able to carry four people, uh, you know, 40 to 60 nautical miles uh, and do so in a safe and efficient way. I do think that the next step really is what I would call the capability demonstration phase. But it isn't just the vehicle. It's capability demonstration phase of the vehicle, the operations in a real urban environment, the integration with the airspace and dealing with other unmanned vehicles that are out there along with traditional aerospace uh, activities going on within and around cities. And so I think that is the next step is you're going to begin to see real demonstrations of capability and they might be trial runs where they're not necessarily carrying people. Maybe they're carrying packages first. Maybe they're on the fringes or outside of cities first and then progressively move in. But I think that is the progression of demonstrations that you'll see to allow us to go to full commercial utilization. Mark, on the rebound. So we are seeing the beginnings of real demonstrators. And in the next two years, we're going to see many, many more. Mm -hmm. um, this is real aircraft that are flying the real missions. And people are going to understand just how close this is. And again, we live in very exciting times where... Bell and Saffron are developing very exciting products that are going to help change people's lives and make them better. I'm pulling one more time from Bell's messaging suite. Coming soon to a neighborhood near you. Love it. Gosh, your messaging is awfully good, Michael. <laughs> um, from Bell, Michael Thacker. From Uber, Mark Moore. From Saffron, Jean-Baptiste Giron. Gentlemen, thank you all, and we'll see you in Las Vegas. Thank you. Look thank forward you. to seeing you thank, there. Thank you. And that is a wrap. Hope you feel a bit more CES ready now. A reminder to subscribe to this podcast. You won't miss any of our episodes as we're getting you geared up and ready for CES 2019. Speaking of the show, January 8th to 11th in Las Vegas. The information you need is at ces.tech. That is ces.tech. As always, none of this is possible without our stars, our engineer, John Lindsay, our producer, Tina Anthony, you are both the best in the business, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm glad you're here. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Tyler Suters. Let's talk tech again soon. <laughs>